Hey, I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. That was the verse that we were looking at last week on uh, what to change, and today we're going to look on how to change. Uh, this is part five in the series on embracing change. Happy Father's Day to everybody, right? <laughs> In the weeks to come, I want to just say something because uh, I'm studying about it. I think it's a part of what we're going to be studying overall. That in the weeks to come, I'm going to be talking specifically about, I'm going to address the idea of how to develop great habits in your life. This is on a series on embracing change and part of my studies have sort of led me to that kind of uh, uh, topic, uh, how to create uh, great habits, trust me, but the better, the better your habits, the better your life, right? Uh, you can brush your teeth or you don't have to brush your teeth. So it's, it's a, you, you, you want to establish really, really good habits in your life. Uh, and, and not just physical habits, but spiritual habits. So we're going to focus specifically on how to develop great habits and how to get rid of some really bad habits, all right? We all probably have, have uh, uh, good habits that we need and bad habits that we don't need. And I'm going to try to address that a lot of times at the beginning of uh, each week. I, I want you to think of a habit as a routine or a practice uh, that you do over and over in your life until it eventually becomes automatic. That's what we want. We want it to be a good habit that you, you just do. You, do. you do it over and over and over. And it just, you don't even have to think about, about what you're actually doing. Uh, it could be anything that needs to change in your life. It could be learning how to say thank you to people who help you, you know, whether it's uh, somebody at, at uh, a store that you're in or a restaurant that you're in or somebody at work that uh, does something for you or somebody that opens the door for you, whatever it is that you learn how to show appreciation, that you learn how to say thank you to to uh, to somebody, uh, you learn to remain patient when people frustrate you. But that's a habit, right? That's a habit that you have to learn. It's uh, uh, it might be that you learn to guard your tongue in a difficult manner. Somebody says something to you is rather ugly, and you just have to guard your tongue. You have to kind of zip it, if I can say it that way, so that you can defuse whatever difficulty may be actually taking place in 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 a, in a relationship uh, here's what we're going to learn I think as we go through this here's what we're going to learn you want to write this down we're going to learn that the great habits are actually going to be the small habits the great habits that you develop in your life are going to be generally the small habits that you develop and you do you can develop small habits easier than you can develop great habits because you can do them day by day by day by day you can say thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you it's a small habit right and it it really uh, it grows the small habits will grow faster, I think, than the great habits that you may want to be, that you may want to have. And I think you'll find that this part of our study is going to be extremely beneficial to anyone who's really serious about their Christian life. Now, this morning, we're going to address the practical side of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18 that we studied last week about growing in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about how to do that. Uh, you don't, you know, I'm thinking that over this series that we'll do the deep dive into the scripture first, uh, and then we'll come back and try to figure out how to implement 
what it is that we're studying in our life, uh, how to change. And I want you to think of spiritual change. I want you to think of spiritual change as that what God, as that, as what God wants to do in your life to create His direction in your life. Uh, we're going to get to a place in, in the Word of God. God wants you to grow in His grace. He wants you to know how to the grace of God is operating in your life. And when you begin to learn that, that becomes your direction. That you learn how to live by grace. You learn how to live, uh, you learn how to be gracious, right? Uh, you and we're, we're going to find some scriptures where God really gives us insight into how that should take place. So, but I want you to I want you to think again about what we studied last week when we got to the verb grow. Right, I spent a lot of time on that verb. It's a present tense imperative mood active voice verb. And what we found out, I think, when we, when we actually studied that, was that we defined spiritual direction as what God wants you to do. That's why it's in the imperative mood, right? That's what the imperative mood means, is that it's something that God wants me to do. It's something that God wants you to do. It's something that God wants you to change. Anytime that he says something in the imperative mood, he, it's his way of saying, I want you to do this. I want you to figure out what you have to do to implement this into your life. Uh, if you uh, uh, tell your children to uh, uh, shut the door, uh, you know, would you please shut the door? Uh, that's their direction, right? But you, you're telling them to do it. You're not just saying, well, uh, okay, if you don't want to shut it, I'll, I'll, I'll shut it for you. Uh, you it's God's way of, of giving you His direction. And uh, we saw that we're always to be growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, God not only wants to change everything about your life, that's a big statement, but he wants to constantly be changing everything about your life. Not just some things. It, God wants to change everything. He wants to transform my life so that it is an image of Jesus Christ. To be changed into the likeness, to be conformed, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8. To be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So it's sort of the idea of, well, what would Jesus really want me to do in this particular circumstance? And so I think that's why this is written not as an option here in verse 18, but as a, a command in the present tense. The active voice means that you're to do it. It's, it's not, God's not saying that he's going to do it for you. He certainly will help you, but... The active voice means that he wants you to do it. And we saw that uh, grace involves two, really, I'm just, this is kind of a review. We saw that grace involves two distinct attributes. One is that grace is when God gives you the desire to do his will. And then secondly, God gives you the power to do his will. You need both. Just because you have the desire to do something doesn't mean that you have the power to actually do it. And so God, when he gives us his grace, he, he not only gives us the want to, but he gives us, he gives us the power to be able to do that. So once you know what to change, then this idea of how to change is where your desire comes in. I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to say. This is really, really important to me. I want to sort of begin this morning with this as sort of a, a, a something that's overviewing everything that we're going to be talking about in this series. If you have no desire to change, 
if you personally have no desire to change, if you have no desire to make any changes in your life, you will never change. You're not going to change. Your children won't change. Your friends won't change. Your boss won't change. If you do not actually have a desire to change. And that's why this idea that God, that part of grace is that God gives us the desire. He helps us with the desire. He gives us the desire in multiple ways. We'll look at some of that here this morning as to how he actually does that. And then once I have that desire, he says, okay, I'm going to help you. I'm going to give you the power to do this. But if you don't have the desire to change, you will not change. You simply will not change. Uh, I want to say that there are people, lost people, listen carefully, lost people that want to change. But because they're lost, they don't really have the power to be able to do that, right? It's like the drug addict that wants to get off of drugs or the alcoholic that wants to stop drinking and they, just, they know where their life is headed. They can, in, right, they can look at the trajectory of where they're going in their life and they know it's not good and they want to stop, but they can't stop. They have the desire to change to some degree, but they don't have the power to change. You do. You do. As a believer, God will give you both of these things in your life so that you don't have to be discouraged. I would say that if your spiritual life is not changing, I think it ought to be changing for every one of us, doesn't matter how old we've been as a Christian or how young we are as a believer, that our life ought to always be changing spiritually. If it's not changing spiritually, then in my mind, you're just not growing spiritually. Because growth always involves change. We have this stinking cornfield I don't know how many acres, how many acres you reckon that is over there. It's 6,000 acres or something that they planted corn. You know, we come up at the end of Bearwood and there's this 6,000 acres of corn and it just, you know, you could see it popping out the ground and trying to figure out what it's going to be and it gets bigger. And now you can't even see over it. I mean, it, you, it's just, it's so tall. That when you drive up to it, you can only just see the front row of this, 6,000 acres or whatever it is, that's a lot of acreage of, of farmland, you know? It's just, it's just, but it's, 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 it's growing. It's growing. And uh, so God wants us, our life to be changing, and the evidence of that is that we are, we're actually growing spiritually. So, uh, making these changes in your life will involve four distinct factors. I want to give you four things. This is a little practical just before we actually get how to change, all right? I want to give you four distinct factors that I think that will help you to be successful in making the changes you know that you need to make. So, you need to write these down. Number one, the first is that is knowing God's direction. For your life you, you have to know what god's direction is for your life you got to figure out what that direction is if god says that something's right then that's the direction he wants you to go in if god says something is wrong then that's the direction that you go in if you're go if you're out here on the highway we this happens to us every day there's a stop sign at the end of chime bell uh there's a there's a yellow line on the road that you don't you don't pass there's a 55 mile an hour speed limit that's 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 the that's the direction right that you want you want to stop down here everybody knows how many times somebody's just run straight through that into into the tree over there that poor tree has been just beat up unmercifully with people running into running through the stop sign so you want to know what God's direction is for your life, and you have to define what you believe that God wants you to change. But 
It has to be based on his word. This is not just some warm, fuzzy feeling that you have one evening, you know, when you're sitting down to eat some asparagus or something. This is something that you get from the word of God. We established that two or three studies ago, and I think it is the crux of this entire study, is that you have to base your changes on that which never changes, right? That was we spent a whole uh, a whole study on changing that your whatever you change you want to it it needs to be based on that which never changes spiritually, and that only comes from the Word of God. It has to be based on the Word of God. Uh, you know, I was thinking about this uh, because. Because when I base my life and I base the changes that I know that I need to make on my life, I know, I can know that I'm headed in the right direction. I, I, I don't want to be going somewhere and headed in the wrong direction. I don't want to be going north and should be going south. I don't want to be going east and should be going west. I want to be going in the direction that God wants me. But God says in his word, he says in Matthew chapter 7, he says, uh, maybe I should say unfortunately, he says that there is a broad way, there, there's a wide gate and there is a broad way, all right? That's one direction. And then in the next uh, verse, he says, but there are the same verse, he says, but there is a narrow gate and he calls it a difficult way now the problem is is that he says that the wide gate and the broad way lead to destruction but the narrow gate and the difficult way lead to life now most people don't like to do things that are difficult and they don't like to be restricted. We live in a culture where everybody wants all of their rights and they, they don't want to be restricted and they want to do everything that they want to do and they don't care if, how it impacts you or, and all of that. And Jesus says, though, that it's, it's, it's the narrow gate through which you enter and it is the difficult way that actually leads to life. He says the broad way, what everybody else is doing, the wide gate leads to destruction. And we see that every day, right? We see it in our culture. We just see the flow of culture. We see where it's going. We see the politics. We see, we just can look and see this broad way and where it actually leads. So once again, uh, we talked about it last week, I think, Jesus has us upside down, right? Remember how we talked about being upside down? That Jesus has us upside down again. It's a paradigm shift that we have to make. So you have to decide what direction you really want your life to be head headed in and what kind of person that you really want to become. Everybody listen to me. If you do not define, if you do not stop and define, to define the kind of person that you want to be and the kind of person that you want to become, it's like running in a race that has no finish line to it. Andy runs these marathons. Well, I can see him starting out here on a 5K one Saturday morning over here at Old Dale Weeks, and they and they 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 said, "Well, where do you end?" They, well, we don't we don't care. We, we don't we don't have a finish line. We just want you to run 5K. You've got to know. You've got to know where the finish line is. What the finish line is. So if you don't have a finish line, if you don't know what you want to become and you don't know what you really want to be in your life, there's no telling where you may end up. Probably not in a good place. So you need to know God's direction. Number two, 
write this down. You have to set some achievable goals. I'm going to be talking about doing this uh, throughout all of this study about setting goals that are, are achievable. Uh, we're going to talk about a process that helps us to do all of that. Let us say, let's say that you want to that you want to lose some weight, right? Well, all of us know how difficult that is. How difficult it is to really lose weight. That's the direction that you want to go. Sounds simple, right? It sounds really simple. Well, I want to lose 20 pounds. But we know that it's not that simple. We know that it's really not that simple. So we can have a goal, but just because we have a goal doesn't mean that we actually have a a way to achieve that goal. Um, the problem is that just knowing what you may want to achieve and actually being able to achieve it, they are two completely different things. So you want, but you want to have a goal. You want to, you want to have something in your life that is driving you to be what God wants you to be and what God wants you to become. And I think that spiritually you have to develop what I want to call achievable goals that will help you stay focused on God's direction for your life. God's got me headed in the right direction and I want to stay headed in that direction. I don't want something to just sort of hurt me and get me turned around, going in a different direction, not going the way that God wants me to go. I want you to think of it this way. I want to, I want to think of it in sort of a, a negative way, that if you're not willing to set godly goals for your life, if you're just not willing to determine and figure out the goals that God wants you to have in your life, then ultimately, you will never have the motivation to change the current direction of your life. In other words, just think about what I've said here. If you, don't, if you don't have a goal, an achievable goal for your life, it could be in any area, it could be at work, it could be in your family, it could be in your relationships. If you don't set some goals and have some achievable goals, then ultimately you'll never have any motivation to change the direction of your life. And what's the adage that we said many times, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you always got. Right? It just works that way. It doesn't matter who you are, things change because of certain reasons. So goals are something that you write down. Goals are something that you write down so that you can keep them before you, that you know that this is what you want to do. The problem is that time has a way of making us forget what we set out to do. So if we'll write our goals down, if we will just simply write them down, how simple is that? You know, oh, Gary, we, we ought to be studying the Bible. Listen, I'm trying to help you grow. My goal is to be is to give you the practical things that need to happen in your life if you really want to change, if you really want to grow. And so, if you don't, if you don't write them down, uh, time will cause you to forget what it is that God wanted you to do. So just write them down. Just Put them in this little brown notebook I gave you, or the teal notebook that you women have. Those are the ones you write. Just write down, this is a goal. Don't, you don't, don't put down 30 goals. You can't. I want to work on this area of my life. I want to work on this one area of my life. I want it to change. I don't like the way that I talk to people. I don't like the way that I relate to people. I don't like, I don't like this part of my life. I want to change it. You've got to give some definition to it based on the Word of God. Goals are something that you write down. So if you do not define your goals, then you have nothing to achieve. 
Does that make sense to everybody? Yes or no? If you, if you don't define your goals, you really have nothing to achieve in your life. The moment you lose sight of God's direction that He wants you to achieve in your life, that's the, that's when you, that's if I look up here, that's when you have plateaued and stopped growing. Right? When you're not trying to achieve the goals that God wants you to have. Number three, you have to be able to measure your progress. I'm, I'm working on something to give you to help you do that. If you want to lose 20 pounds, I, this is, I, know, I know you think this is dumb. If you want to lose 20 pounds in, in two months, um, if that's what you want to do, uh, then here's what you do. Everybody listen. You simply divide 20 by 8, right? Can everybody do the math? I know Daniel can do it for me. Daniel, what is 20 divided by 8? It's two and a half. It's two and a half. So every week you have to lose two and one half pounds. Right? Everybody, everybody understand that? that? That you can measure your progress. Does everybody here have uh, a scale that you can stand on? Right? You go stand on it and you look down. I, I weighed this morning. I've lost uh, a lot of weight uh, on this stinking diet they have me on just in, in the last three or four days. There, there comes that wasp. Wasp, would you just please go away? Just don't worry about the wasp. I know, we've never had anybody stung by a wasp, but we've had plenty of wasps. So. He likes your son. Huh? He likes your son. Yeah. So, that's two and a half pounds each week. If you have a scale, you can measure your progress, right? Everybody say right. That's mine. If, if you have a scale, you go stand on it. How, how much did I lose this week, or this uh, this week? Did I did I lose two and one half pounds this week? You can find uh, some kind of diet that helps you achieve this. I've got one I'm working on right now. I'll give it to you. Uh, you won't feel too good after eating it, but you, you can lose the weight. You can just drop it off. So spiritually, you have to know how to measure whether or not you're actually making any kind of meaningful progress. For me, personally, and this is just my opinion, but it, you would be better off if you had somebody that held you accountable to your goals. Somebody that's going to be uh, that's going to be honest with you, that's going to help you. It could be a friend, it could be your marriage partner, it could be anybody, but you set this goal. Uh, if you were losing weight and you really wanted to lose weight, you could go to Weight Watchers. So what is Weight Watchers? Weight Watchers is just simply somebody that you become accountable to. And you want to know why you go back to them? Because you give them money, right? If you didn't pay them money, you wouldn't be going back to them. But you need somebody to help you be accountable to the goals that you want to achieve. You want to be able to measure your progress. And let them help identify whether or not you're actually making any progress. And then number four, and then I'll stop and we'll get into how to change, which is a little bit, a little bit different. If you're not making any progress, let's just say that you're really sincere, you want to make the progress, that God's given you a desire, but you're really not achieving the changes that you want to make. And this is number four. You need to adjust your goals, right? You just need to adjust it. We always need to adjust things in our life. Everybody does. I do. You do. Uh, 
the goal is to make meaningful progress. So if that's not happening, if you know that's not happening, then you need to make some adjustments. We're going to find out, we're going to see as we go through the study that making the small adjustments are what create the biggest results, all right? Uh, I've, I've, I've never forget, I was watching the, one of the Super Bowl games that Atlanta was playing. And they were leading by 28 points. It might have been more at one time. They were leading by 28 points going into the fourth quarter, and they lost. They lost. In fact, the owner of the Falcons had come down, and he was, he was down there. He was going to get the trophy, and then it just didn't work out that way. Because the other team made some strategic adjustments. Anybody that's a good coach, what do they do at halftime? What do they do at halftime? Somebody tell me. They adjust. They make adjustments. It doesn't matter if they're winning or if they're losing. They make adjustments so that they can win. They go in, they sit everybody down, they take the offensive and the defensive and whatever those coaches, and they go over and they look at videos and they give them this and that and they make adjustments and we want to change this. That's how you win, right? You're willing to make adjustments in your life. Maybe your goals just need to be downsized. Maybe, maybe they just need to be reevaluated. Maybe we talked last week, you need to make some other adjustments in your life to help you meet the goals that you want to meet for the future. And I think that for most people, this is just my opinion, okay, that this idea of making adjustments is a necessity. Because you're going to get to a place in your life where the enemy is working against you. He doesn't want you to base your life on that which never changes. And then you start out to make those changes in your life and to grow in your life and to, to enter in through the narrow gate. I know it's talking about salvation and be on the difficult way. He doesn't want you to be successful. So somewhere along the way, if you are being defeated, you have to make some adjustments. This is common sense, right? This is, this is, this, this is not Bible 101. This is just common sense 101 that I'm sharing here with you. So just uh, get with a person that you can have as an accountability partner. Let them give you some insight into what kind of adjustments you may need to make. Now I want you to write down four words, okay? These are the four simple things that you need to do if you want to be successful in making the changes that God wants you to make. Just write these four words down, all right? I've, I've just given them to you. You want to know, you want to set, you want to measure, and you want to adjust. You want to know, you want to set, you want to measure, you want to adjust. You want to know God's direction, you want to set some achievable goals, you want to measure what you're accomplishing, and if you're not, you want to adjust. No set, measure, and adjust, okay? Not okay with everybody? Okay. I'm not trying to treat you like this is elementary school. How many people in your life right now today do you know that need to make serious changes in their life? That's right, all those. But there are some people that need to make them even worse. And they don't know how. They don't even have the desire to make the changes. They're just going to keep doing what they've always done. And until they get to that place that they're willing to make the changes that God wants them to make, not that they want to make, their life is headed in the wrong direction. We all know people like that. And we want to be able to help, help them. And sometimes, you, sometimes, if I can say it this way, please forgive me, you have to simplify everything. 
You have to simplify everything so that people can understand what it is that they need to do. You, you need to help them be able to do that. We, we had a long discussion yesterday and Tim was here and, and uh, Larry was here and me and a couple other guys and we had a long discussion about, about making things complicated, right? One of the brothers, every time that you say something, he says, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. I got tired of listening to yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. I can't do all the yeah, buts, right? Uh, it's like, yeah, but we need to, you know, but you need to do, you know, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. No, I want to do one thing. Yeah, but. And I, I just had to, I had to stop him. I mean, we, we had a long discussion about it on the way home, so, which was good. He I said, figured you ruined your ride home with that one. Huh? Do what? I figured you ruined your ride home with that no, one. No, no, we had a great time. <laughs> no, we had a great time. So, I want to talk about how to change. And this change is related directly, look back at, 2 Peter chapter two, 3, verse 18. It's about how do you actually grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to address how you grow in the, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That will sort of come up as we go through it, but that's not what I'm really focusing on. What do you need to do? What do you need to change in order to grow in your understanding of the grace of God? I think that the bigger question is how, what do I have to do in my life to receive the grace of God? Or what am I doing in my life that's hindering the grace of God from operating in my life? This is the spiritual side. This is kind of away from this practical stuff that I have just addressed here. Let me say it in a very simple way. Write this down. I've said this many times to you. How do you get the grace of God, okay? How do you grow in the grace of God? Just listen very carefully. I'm going to simplify it in... in hang on, Daniel. I'm going to count these. One, two, three, four, five, six words. You must write this down. Here it is. You must do what is right. You just have to do what's right. Now that's the, that's the overarching principle. You don't do what's wrong and expect to get what's right. A lot of people live that way. They just keep doing the wrong things and they get the wrong results and they can't figure it out. They may say the wrong thing. They say something ugly to somebody. That doesn't work. They don't tell somebody the truth. That doesn't work. All of it eventually catches up with you, right? Right? Eventually, it just comes full circle. Somebody may just get angry all the time. That doesn't work. It doesn't work. You have to make the adjustment. You have to make the change. you're prone to continue doing what you know is wrong, then you will actually be removing the grace of God for your life. Let's just say there's something in your life that you know that God wants you to change. But you're struggling. You're struggling in your life. You're struggling in 
different areas of your life and, and this is not working the way you want it to work and that's not working in the way that it should work. And, but you know that God wants you to change something, but you're constantly resisting that change. There, there goes the wasp. Should I, I, I have a flash water up here. Sit on the light. All right. You know, I just wonder what somebody that's listening to the video <laughs> thinks. Huh. So. So if you're prone to continue doing what you know is wrong, then you're actually removing the grace of God from your life. Right? We're, we're trying to figure out how to get the grace of God, how to grow in the grace of God in our life. I want to give you four ways on how to grow in this area of growing in the grace of God. Number one, these are simple. These are simple. You're going to say, oh, this is basic Christianity 101. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You have to let go of all known sin in your life. You just have to let it go. If you know that there's things in your life that you're doing that's wrong, just let go of them. You don't do them. I'll give you plenty of verses here. This is how you receive the grace of God. Do y'all remember the illustration that I gave you probably several years ago about the monkey and how they captured this stinking monkey over in the Philippines or something? You did last week. Did I do it? Yeah, you told us last week. I told it here? Oh, okay, never mind. I won't tell you again. He, you know, but he, he puts his hand in there and he grabs the nut and he won't let go. And so they just come up and take the plug out the other side of the tree and then they pull his hand through. He won't let go of what he needs to let go of. I didn't hear that. What happened to the monkey's hand? Did, did, did I share that or was this us talking? <coughs> No, it's okay. All right, I'll give you the illustration again. No, no, I think it was in a conversation that we had with, with, with another person, you know. You can't just get us curious. No, 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 no. So what they, do, what they do is that they cut this hole, they drill a hole through the tree, and on one side they make it a little bit bigger, and they put a nut in there, and they plug it up, and then on the other side, the hole is just big enough for the little monkey to get its hand through through, the, through that little hole. And he knows there's a nut in there. And he reaches in there and he gets the nut. But when he grabs the nut, it, he has to ball it up in his fist and the hole is so narrow that he can't pull his fist down. So he's just sitting there on the tree and there's some people coming to get him. But he's not letting go of that stinking nut. I, this is my nut. <laughs> I'm holding on to my nut. <laughs> and so they just reach in the other side, pull the nut out of his hand, and then pull him off the tree. And there he goes. Not a good idea. You know what the, you know what the monkey should have done? It's just let go of the nut. <laughs> right? There are just things in our life that we have to let go of. You just have to let go of it. You must choose to let go of all of the things that you know are not acceptable to God. You look at this part of your life and say, is that what God wants me to do? Yes or no? It's either a yes or no, right? There's no maybe. Is this the way that God wants me to live. Is this what God wants to be happening in my life? Yes or no? If it's a no, you let go. If it's a no, you let go. It's really, really very, very simple. 
It's like driving on the right side of the road, right? The right side is right. You let go of the no. You just stop. You know it's wrong before God. If you want God's grace in your life, if you want the desire and the power to do the will of God, then you have to be willing to deal with those things in your life that you know are displeasing to God, that are not acceptable to Him, that are not what He would want you to do. The things that are causing you to be disobedient. Now, just keep your place here, please, in Second Peter. But I want you to turn to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. I want you to look at verse 1. Now this is clear. There's nothing here that is difficult to understand. You don't have to be a theologian to figure this out. It says in verse 1, wait for everybody to get there. It says in verse 1, what shall we say then? God's done all this really remarkable stuff for us, uh, justified us and given us faith to believe and all of that. And it says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now this is a rhetorical question, right? Now everybody says, right. right. This is a rhetorical question. Do you just continue in sin that grace may abound? Do you think that you can get grace by just continuing in sin? Anybody here think that? Yes or no? No. 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 It's a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. The answer is clear. <clears throat> he actually says in verse 2, certainly not. Absolutely not. No way, Jose. You never want to continue in sin. Ever. You have to begin somewhere in your life if you're going to grow in the grace of God and this is where you begin. You let go of the no's, right? If this is a no before God, you just, just think about the monkey. All right? Just think about the stinking monkey the next time that you want to do something that you know is wrong. You're the monkey. I'll say it this way. I'm the stupid monkey when I don't let go of what I know is wrong. You must allow God to cleanse your life of anything that you know is displeasing to Him, no matter what it is or its cost to you personally. Is it, is, are the changes that God wants you to make in your life Will they have a cost to them? Yes. Everything that's valuable has some cost to it. Commitment to Christ has a cost to it, right? Jesus said, in no unsimple terms, that you take up your cross daily. It's a place where you die to the things that you want to do so that you can be what God wants you to be. There are inappropriate things that you have to stop doing. There are ugly words that you have to stop saying. There, there are areas of your life that you have to stop. You have to put them to death if you really want to experience the grace of God in your life. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. Gary eats popcorn. Man, what an easy way to remember that. Andrew, my son, gave me yesterday for Father's Day. I got something in the mail. He said, we're sending you popcorn every month for three months. <laughs> I thought that was just, I thought that was great. We're going to send you popcorn for three months. That's what 
Oh my goodness. Everybody's got me pegged, right? All my kids know what I do on Sunday night, Benjamin. Eat popcorn. I can't eat this week. Happy what I do on Sunday night. Huh? Is the popcorn you send to you popped or curled? No. No, it's curled. I got to pop it. No. So I guess that means with all this candy, weight laws, oh, I shouldn't make you pick out pies anymore. <laughs> well, you got to figure out what you want. Colossians chapter 3. I want you to look at me as I read in chapter five and uh, verse five through ten. Verse five. I'm going to add a word, all right, because the word is actually here and understood in the Greek. You'll see it if you're looking at your translation that it's not probably in yours. It's the word "you." It says, "Therefore, you." Immediately, before we ever read this, what God does here is that He says, this is a choice that you have to make. I'm not going to make the choice for you. I'm going to tell you what it is that I want you to do, but I'm going to leave that choice up to you. This is a choice that you have to make. You have to choose. It says, therefore you put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. In which you yourselves once walked, you used to live like that when you lived in them, but now, obviously you are different. You're born again, you have the Spirit of God in you but now you yourselves are to put off all of these you yourself put these things off put off anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy and filthy language out of your mouth and don't lie to one another why because you have put off the old man with his deeds you don't live like that anymore. You, you put to death the things that need to be put to death. God says, I want you to do that. I want you to put off the things that you know that are wrong. I'll give you just a small list here. And then I want you to put on the new man. I want you to dress like you ought to be dressed. When people see you, when people hear you, when people talk to you, when people are uh, a part of your life, they see what you've put on. Put on the new man who's renewed in knowledge according to the ch changes, according to the image of him who created him. Now I want to say something really critical about making godly decisions and Godly choices in your life, all right? So listen carefully. This is a choice. Everybody see that? Everybody, everybody see in verses 5 through 10, God's not saying He's going to do this for you. He's, he wants you to do it, all right? You got to have the desire to do it before you'll ever get the power to do it. Enjoying the life, this is what I want you to listen to carefully, enjoying the life that God wants you to experience begins with making small but extremely important decisions that you do consistently over time. I want to stay away from the big things that you, I, I know take too long to achieve. Let's just start with the small things that you have to do. He gave us three things here. There are things that you put to death in your life. There are things that you put off and then there are things that you put on. If this is wrong, you take it off. 
And then you put on that which is right. You take it off. You put something on in its place. What small godly decisions do for you is that they keep reinforcing God's will for your life. I probably brush my teeth three or four times a day, at least. If I'm not at the doctor all day. I just keep reinforcing a good habit right I just keep reinforcing what I know is the right thing to do I remember I went to this one doctor one time this one dentist and you look up in the ceiling you know they got all these signs up there that make you feel bad and this one said it said if you don't if you don't brush your teeth they'll just go away something like that <clears throat> Just brush the ones that you want to keep. Yeah. I'm sitting there looking at this thing while he's cleaning my teeth or something. If you don't brush your teeth, they'll just go away. A lot of truth in that, right? They just go away. You do small godly, you make small godly decisions that keep reinforcing God's will for your life. Doing the right thing, doing the small godly things over and over. What they do is that they have a, a cumulative and a compounding impact on your life. It's like the person that learns to start saving money when they're 15. And they put up a little bit and then they put up a little bit more when they get a better job and they put up some more and at at some point in their life all of that money has compounded they just did a little bit they didn't do a lot they just kept putting up a little bit every month every week and the next thing you know they had a lot more than they thought they would have because of compounding interest you make the right decisions today to ensure what you're going to be like tomorrow. You can't be like you want to be tomorrow unless you make the decisions today that that's what you want to be. Right? right. If you want to be a certain way, if you want to be a certain kind of person, you have to start now. You have to start today. To become that person. And you have to do the right things. You have, to, you have to put off the old and put on the new. Just keep being ugly to people today. And I can tell you exactly where you will be tomorrow. It, it, you can tell me where you'll be tomorrow. If you just keep being ugly to people. You won't like it. Here's the problem. You've got to write this down. I think this is important. Time just simply feeds. Time just uh, multiplies whatever you feed it. Time multiplies whatever you feed it. You want to be a kind person? Well, then start being kind today. Do you want to be somebody that that when somebody sees you, they say, that's a, they, that's a really kind individual. It just compounds itself. It just grows. It's, it's cumulative because the more that you feed it, I think you could think of it this way. Good decisions make time your ally. If I make a good decision, I really feel good about it, right? I feel good about making good decisions. But if you make bad decisions, if you make really bad decisions, they make time your enemy. 
It takes a lot more time to recover from really bad decisions than it does to recover from good decisions. And I think just making one small godly change in your life can change everything about your life. Focus on making some small changes. They don't have to be big. But you know that they're the kind of changes that God wants you to make. That's what this whole series is about. Just keep believing God. Keep sharing your faith. Keep fighting to stay pure. Keep telling your marriage partner and your children, I love you. Keep telling them that. I have no idea how many times a day I tell my wife that I love her. She can't get out of the bed without me telling her her that I love her. She can't get in the bed without me telling her that I love her. She can't get in the car without me telling her that I love her as I buckle her up. Isn't that right, baby? You're supposed to say right. Right. If you love somebody, tell them. Leave them a note. My goodness. When I used to travel, Brenda just put notes everywhere. I mean, I'd find them in my coat pockets, I'd find them in my shirt pockets, I'd find them in my toiletries, I'd find them in my suitcase, I would find them in my Bible, I'd find them everywhere. I don't know how many notes that you would write every time that I was gone for a week or two, 10 days. Love you, sweetheart, praying for you, sweetheart. Love you so much. It has a compounding effect, right? I want you to write this down, okay? I'm trying to take notes for you, so you can get it online, but Julie put it online. But Keep choosing what you want. Keep choosing what you want most. Keep choosing what you want most over what you want now. So every day, just keep making godly, small godly decisions. Everybody listen to me, and God will give you His grace. God will give you His grace. Just let go of what you know God wants you to let go of. Put to death, put off, put on. Number two, do not resist the changes that God wants to make in your life. You have to appreciate that God wants to make changes in your life. Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter what level you're at. Doesn't matter if you're a pastor or if you're eight years old. God wants to make changes in everybody's life. Top to bottom. Just don't resist. You let go of what you need to let go, and then you don't resist. You don't resist the changes that you know God wants to make in your life. This is how you receive His grace. The biblical word for this is humble yourself. Everybody turn, if you would, to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. And verse 6. You must humble yourself before God and be willing to accept that you are not where God really wants you to be. None of us are there yet. Some people think that spiritual change is painful. I think it's exhilarating. I think it's kind of exciting. And the reason that I think that spiritual change is so exhilarating to me is that it lets me know that God is working in my life. It lets me know that God Almighty in heaven sees me, is pleased that He is changing me. 
James chapter 4, verse 6 gives us a lot of insight. It says, but he gives more grace. He's got so much grace to give and he gives more grace and he says, okay, God resists the proud. God resists the man. God resists the woman. God resists the young person. God resists that individual that is always resisting doing what it is that they know He wants them to do. That's just being proud. I, I, I know more than God. I, no, nobody's ever going to say it that way, right? Nobody's going to say it that way. Nobody's going to say, well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm resisting God because I think my way is better. But our choices reflect that. Our direction, going in the wrong direction, reflects that. Our words reflect that. Our actions reflect that. God resists the proud, but, what a huge word. He gives grace to the humble. You want God's grace? He wants you to humble himself yourself and accept that he wants to make changes in your life God gives grace growing in grace God gives grace to that person that's not always resisting not always fighting not always arguing about God I don't want to change I'm not going to change it's the person that just submits their life to Him. You know, I was thinking about this, and maybe I'm just, uh, just too elementary in the way that I think, but it doesn't even make sense to resist God. I mean, it actually, to me, it actually sounds stupid when I say it. Does this sound stupid to you? Man, it sounds stupid to me. Well, I'm just going to resist God. I'm not going to do what He wants me to do. God gives His grace to the men and women who do not resist the changes that He wants to make in their life. They hear the Word of God being taught. You can hear the Word of God being taught in a lot of different ways. They read the Word of God. They fellowship with other believers. They pray. And in the process of all of that, God begins to speak to them, begins to give them direction. They listen to good, sound, biblical teaching. They read the Word of God on a regular basis. They fellowship with mature believers. They seek God in prayer about their life. And when he speaks to them, they willingly and readily choose to address the changes that they need to make in their life. They don't argue about it. Just don't fight with God about it. Do you want the grace of God in your life? You'll never get it if you're going to be arguing with God about what he wants to change. And fighting with God and resisting him in that area of your life. You're always going to be struggling. Every day is going to be a struggle in some area of your life. Why? Because the grace of God is not operating as He wants it to operate in your life. Just humble yourself before God. No argument, no ignoring, no resisting. And he will give you His grace. Number three. Number one is just let go. Number two is do not resist. Number three is accept that how God makes spiritual changes in your life is much better than how you want to make those changes. Just accept that how God makes spiritual changes in your life is better than how you would make the changes. I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to tell that person exactly what I want to say. I want to be bitter. 
I'll be bitter. If I want to get angry, I'll get angry. Okay, go ahead. Have fun. Enjoy the displeasure. Enjoy the pain. Just enjoy it, because that's all you're going to get. This is how you receive the grace of God. We always want everything to be easy. And if it's not easy, then we generally do not want it. If it's not easy, hey, I'll try a different way. I'm going to tell you that Jesus said, narrow is the gate and difficult is the way, right? Difficult is the way that leads to life. You want life? It's going to cost you something. Here's my humble advice to you. Just, just my advice. Just my humble advice as your pastor. Never question how God achieves his results in your life because it will rarely, if ever, be what you chose it to be. If you truly believe that God is who he says that he is, then why would you ever question his wisdom and how he chooses to work in your life? When you get discouraged, just keep going. Just keep going. There's something about perseverance, right? That God is teaching us. There's some days, I know this is going to sound a little self that's the right word, placating, but there's some days I just want to get discouraged. <laughs> I'm tired. I had, a really, I had a really bad day yesterday. My family's home, Benjamin's home. I just had a bad day. Headaches. I didn't feel good, out of breath, all, all of that. I, I wanted to get discouraged. I wanted to feel sorry for myself. And I just couldn't do it. When you want to say something harsh, somebody give me the answer. No, no. Don't. Hallelujah. I like the quick answers. Somebody's listening, right? When you feel hurt, what do you do? You forgive. You just forgive. Do you think that forgiveness is better than bitterness? Somebody tell me, yes or no? Yes. No. Forgiveness is so much better than being bitter. When you don't feel love, just show some love, right? Just do what you know God wants you to do. Accept that to be how He works, and God will give you His grace. Number four. All right, we let go. We do not resist. We accept. Number four, we choose to make godly choices in our life. We choose. We make a choice. That's how you receive the grace of God. You make godly choices. Everybody listen to me carefully. It's the most, it's the most difficult choices that you make that give you the greatest life. We have a prime example of that in... Jesus Christ. He had to make the most difficult choices that anybody has ever had to make. I don't think the most difficult choice was even getting on the cross. I think the most difficult choice was leaving his father to become the God man forever, to give up everything and never be able to be like that again.
But I can, I can assure you that it was the greatest choice that was ever made. Not having the courage to make the right choices will stifle you. It will paralyze your life. Understand that when you make the right choices that you never see the results today. You never see the results today. Here's what happens. You plant the right seeds and then you wait for the harvest. You plant the right seeds. Now, how simple is this? You plant the right seeds. You wait for the harvest. I've been just waiting for some of my stinking tomatoes. They're so big, Tim. They're clustered together like I've never had tomatoes before in my life. And they're all green. Patience. Patience. I've made a choice. I'm not even looking at them. I let my wife go out there and get it. Benjamin goes out there yesterday and brings in three red tomatoes. It was like, hallelujah, I'm going to stay away from them. <laughs> you just wait for the harvest. You shape your life the way that it should be shaped by just doing the right things. I think you ought to always ask yourself the question. Here are the question. Questions. These are so simple. These are what shape your life. Is this what God would want me to do? Is this how God would want me to talk? Is this how God would want me to treat somebody? It's either yes or no. It's just yes or no. There's nothing hard here, nothing difficult. If this is not how what God would want you to do, then choose not to do it. If this is not how God would want you to talk, then choose not to do it. Make the choice, right? Choose to make godly choices. If this is not how God would want you to treat somebody, then choose not to do it. And when you make those choices, that's when God gives you His grace. That's when you begin to grow in the grace of God. Let's make these four changes. Write these down. Just write these down, okay? Let go. Do not resist. Accept. Choose. Let go of what you know is wrong. Do not resist what you know is right. Accept that how God works is different. And choose to do the right thing. And that's how you will grow in the grace of God. That's choosing to let God change you. And that's how it works. All right, any questions or any comments? All right.